scripture reading. You ever been to the junkyard? To the dump? The landfill? You ever been there? You know what it looks like? Right? Has everybody experienced that at least once in their lifetime? Some people call it the dump. I call it the dump. But it's the landfill, you know, the bath. When you when you get there, doesn't it just smell good? <laughs> Mm. But what's it filled with? What do you see? Trash. trash. We got household trash, right? We got bags of our leftover scrap food, spoiled things that we clean through the house, right? We got bags of that stuff. And then you got what? You got probably got some bottles out there, right? We got sometimes you see furniture out there, right? You see people discarded furniture. What else you see out there? Appliances. Right? You ever see every once in a while you see an appliance and somebody's discarded an appliance. Maybe it does, I guess it's broke, it doesn't work anymore. What else you see? Seagulls. Seagulls. <laughs> Seagulls are out there looking for something to eat. You see Billy's old TV out there. <laughs> no, I'm just the, uh, but you still do see TVs out there, right? <laughs> and, and you see computers. Last time I was there, I noticed they had kind of like we're sectioning that stuff off now, where you, like, like you put your appliances over here, and you, you don't just when it used to be, you just go and just dump it all in one place, and they move it and trash. Sometimes it's limp. But what does all that stuff have in common? We bought it all and took it home one time because we wanted it. That's right. It's all stuff we wanted at one time had some value, but what is it now? They don't want it. It's not needed anymore. It's not wanted anymore. What else? <laughs> I mean, it's seen as what? Useless? Worthless. Worthless? Broken? Some of it's broken? Garbage. Garbage? <laughs> Trash? How many other names we can come up with? Now, let me ask you another question. You ever been to a yard sale? <laughs> or a garage sale? <laughs> or even thrift stores? What do you see in there? One man's junk, another man's trash. <laughs> exactly. You see the same stuff that you see half the time. You see the same stuff that you see at the dump. Now, what's the difference? It had value to somebody. Somebody made it, put a price on it, didn't they? Somebody said it was worth something, right? If say, you are selling one of them little red stickers at 25 cents or whatever, or $2, whatever, you know? But somebody said that junk had value. Now, it's the same, a lot of times, same junk you'll find at the dump in reality. Right? It's just that somebody thought it had value. Hmm. Well, I guess sometimes the stuff at the dump is broken, though, right? So, but, you know, the thing about broken stuff is it can be restored, can it? It can be fixed up. So I guess it does have potential, right? To be to be something. What about people? You ever experienced somebody who was broken? You ever experienced somebody who was just the world just beat them up. You know, maybe their day was, was a bad day. Maybe they got let go from their job. Maybe somebody they had to invest in their life had left them. Maybe they made poor financial decisions and were bankrupt. Maybe their heat got cut off today. Maybe they're just broken because they're addicted to their sin. A lot of broken people out there. You ever been broken? You ever felt broken? I want to, don't raise your hand because I want to tell you. I think most people at some point have felt broken. Maybe for a few hours. Maybe for a day, maybe a week, a month. I 
know some people have felt broken all their life. <laughs> but either way, there are a lot of broken people out there. I can assure you, if you feel broken, if you've ever felt broken, or you feel broken, you're not by your self. I guess misery loves company. You might be one way of saying it. But today we're going to visit a piece of scripture that deals with broken people. What a coincidence. We hear the story of Simon. Simon is a Pharisee. He's a religious leader. And he has invited Jesus to his house. Now, Simon, I don't think he really cares too much for Jesus. Now, I don't know why he's having the party, why he's having Jesus over there. Uh, maybe it was just, you know, his day on host the rabbi, I don't know. Or, or maybe he pulled the short camel hair when they were drawing straw. I don't know. But I don't think he liked him. And there's a reason I say that, that I don't think he really liked him. Because Simon doesn't extend Jesus the courtesies that you would normally extend somebody coming to your house. In those days, if someone came to your house, you would normally welcome them with a kiss to the hand. Let them know they were welcome in your house. But the scripture tells us that Simon didn't kiss Jesus' hand. We're also told that Simon didn't wash Jesus' feet. You see, when when in those days, you know, they wore sandals at best. And, and if you've ever, how many of you have had kids, but had kids, and you let them go outside and run around barefoot in the summer, you know, in the dust. You know, if you had a yard like my yard used to be, it was more dirt than grass. And uh, I tried, but it just wasn't real successful. So my kids would come back in, their feet would be filthy, right? And so, of course, you wash them off. Well, that's how it was every day with Jesus. So when you went to someone's house to eat, the first thing they would do is they would either wash your feet, being a, being a good host, or they would offer you a bowl of water and a towel to wash your feet so you could sit down and you would be clean to eat. Makes sense, right? But Simon, no. Not so much. No courtesy extended. They would also take oil and they would anoint your head with oil, with a fragrance. Simon didn't anoint Jesus' hand. You know, he didn't make Jesus feel very welcome at all. And I have to wonder what that must have felt like to the other people who were there at the party at this dinner. Because surely they recognized it. See, it's not like Simon didn't know he was supposed to do these things. You know, it's different. Like, if, if I'm having you all over to the house, and Pam says, well, set the dinner table, and I, and I put the salad fork in the wrong place, you know, you know, the small fork and the big fork. Hey, if I put the salad fork in the wrong place, it's not that I intentionally do it, it's just I don't know the difference. I just forks. You know. There's a difference between not knowing and then knowing and not doing. And Simon knew what the courtesy was. He knew what he should do to make Jesus feel welcome in his home, and yet he did none of it. There had to be a little tension in the room. I mean, I got one word that describes Simon. Rude. It was rude the way he treated Jesus. Now, have you ever been to a party where somebody was kind of ostracized? Just something didn't seem right? There's kind of a tension in the room, isn't there? It's kind of like, hmm, wow, this is just not doing. I wonder what's up between him and Jesus. I wonder why he's not making him feel welcome. And can you imagine how the tension, <laughs> how it got a little crazy, when in walks this woman. Now it says she was a sinful woman. Most people think she was a prostitute. Because that's usually what that meant. During the time. So she was a prostitute. So in walks this prostitute. Can you imagine the other guests? They knew who she was. This wasn't a secret. I mean, things just got real uncomfortable really fast. And they're standing there, and this woman, can you imagine the eyes? Can you imagine the eyes on her? Think about that. They're glaring at her like, what are you doing? You're not on the list. It wasn't Bill, George, and the prostitute. It wasn't like that. You're not on the list. What are you doing here? Why are you approaching the rabbi? 
You're not welcome here. That's what she was seeing in people's eyes. But then she looks at Jesus. And Jesus looks at her. And you know, I don't think Jesus saw her as an unwelcome guest. I don't think Jesus saw her as trash. I think Jesus saw her as a treasure. Because Jesus knew that each of God's children, no matter where they are in life, are valuable to the Father above. <coughs> That each of them is loved. And he didn't come for some of them. He came for all of them. And if he came to die for all of them, they must have some value. Somebody say amen. 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 And this woman looks in his eyes and she begins to cry. And the tears begin to roll down her face. And she drops to Jesus' feet and they begin to flow even harder. Like water over a rock. They fall on Jesus' feet and through her tears she clearly sees that he has been neglected. That the common courtesy of someone washing his feet has not been taken care of and she takes it upon herself. And she begins to wash his dirty feet with her tears. And she takes down her hair and begins to dry his feet as though her hair were a towel. Now, I don't want you to take that lightly because I want you to understand something. That women of that time kept their hair up. And the only person allowed to see them with their hair down was their husband. So for you to appear before men with your hair down, mm -mm -mm. so I imagine when she took that hair down to dry Jesus' feet, that silence, that awkward silence in the room probably was a... You <gasps> probably heard the gas. Then she took a flask, an alabaster flask. She kept it around her neck. A lot of times women would keep uh, perfume or oil around their neck. They didn't bathe quite as often as we bathe today. <laughs> And, uh, and if she was a lady of, uh, if she was a prostitute, she would probably have needed to use that to keep smelling fresh. But she takes it and she anoints Jesus' feet with this perfume. And she doesn't take a drop, a drop would have done. You need a little drop of that. Kind of, it says so she poured it out. She emptied it. <coughs> Maybe she knew she wouldn't need it anymore. Maybe she was changed. But she gave all she had. And she anointed his feet. Now Simon, he didn't like that, did he? He didn't like that at all. It says he thought to himself, he didn't say it. He didn't say it. That, you know, his displeasure, but he thought it. And of course, Jesus knew what he was thinking. I hate that. You know, sometimes I think things like, I hope Jesus don't hear that. <laughs> but, uh, but he heard his thing. And he corrects him, doesn't he? He tells him, but basically he's right to forgive those who sin a little, is what he's telling them. And he's right to forgive those who sin a lot. And which one would love him more? The one who had sinned a lot and the one who sinned a little. He said, well, the one who sinned a lot would probably love him more. He said, you've got to forgive him more. He said, you're right. He probably would. And he tells the woman her sins are forgiven. That her, her faith has saved her. Her faith, not that she washed his feet. Her, her faith has saved her. He knew it was in her heart as well. Now let me ask you a question. That's a great story, isn't it? Which person are you? No, I'm not going to ask you that. I guess I could. Which person do you want to be? 
Would you rather be the religious leader who learned a lesson, or would you rather be the woman who was forgiven, forgiven her sins and made whole again? Now, I'm not going to ask you that. You know why I'm not going to ask you that? Because that's not the point of the story. Here's the point of the story. We're all broken. We're all broken. Romans 3.23 tells us what? We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. So we're all sinners. We're all broken. Some may just be cracked a little. Some may be shattered. Trying to figure out how to put back the pieces. But we're all broken people. Simon was broken. The guests at the table were broken. The woman we know is broken. But Jesus forgives them all. You only need to encounter the Master, right? We all know broken people in this world. Some of us are broken. Some of our break brokenness is deep down inside and we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to keep it buried and we don't want the world to see it. Some of our brokenness is on the outside where people can see it and say, well, you know, that person can't keep a job and that person's, you know, I don't know, you know, they're worthless. Don't ever say that about somebody. That's a child of God. They all have value. Jesus saw value in them. If Jesus saw value in them, then you should see value in them. Right? Everyone is worth something. God put you here for a purpose. Nobody's here by accident. You know, sometimes we feel broken and sometimes we feel worthless. And I've been there myself where I was so down on myself and things in life had happened to me and I was like, you know, I'm just, you know, I was, I, you know, I just felt like I had no value. And then I remembered. I was created by God. And God don't make no junk. God doesn't make garbage. God doesn't make trash. Everyone has a value. You have a value. And you and you and you. And I can name every person here. Everybody I encounter has a value. God didn't send his son to die for you because you were worthless. Think about that. Do you think he would have sent his son to die for you if you had no value to him? Absolutely not. But we have to see past the garbage. Past the obvious. Sometimes to find people's value. There's a story that I read by... Uh, it was in a book I was reading by Kyle Idleman, excuse me. And uh, he told of this community down in Paraguay. They lived in a landfill. The community was actually in the landfill. And they dumped 1,500 tons of garbage in that landfill every day. And people would make a living going through and they dig and they find something of you know, value, trying to find something they could sell, something of value. But the community isn't known for that. The community is known for their orchestra. An orchestra. You say, what is an orchestra doing in the landfill? Now, it's not a philharmonic like Philadelphia. You know, it's not one of those where, you know, they have the grand piano or the, the violin section with the fine violins and somebody even saying, would you pass me the gray poop on and leave the, you know, not that. But it is a mighty fine orchestra. You see this gentleman by the name of Fabio uh, Sanchez went to visit there. And he saw the condition of the people. And he was appalled that nobody was helping them. And so he said, he was a professional musician, excuse me. And he said, I'm going to start a music school here. Right here in the community. And it wasn't that long he had over 100 people lined up little kids that wanted to learn to play instruments. The only problem was he didn't have any instruments. So he went, he, he met this gentleman, Mr. Gomez, he, who was a picker, who went out and picked stuff trash. He said, I want you to gather me anything I can make an instrument out of. 
and bring it to me. And so he did. And he brought him oil drums and silverware and tubs and x-ray sheets. And they created an orchestra. They made the x-ray sheets served as the skins for drums. The oil drum served as the bass for the cello. And they tuned with the forks. You see, they took the garbage that was in that landfill and they made their own instruments. They made their own instruments and he taught the children to play on those instruments. You see, when me and you go to the landfill, we smell that stench and we see the garbage. But he saw something more than that. He heard the sound of hope and he placed it in those children's lives. You see, I think when God looks at our brokenness, He treats us kind of the same way. He looks beyond our brokenness and He sees your potential. He sees the talents and the gifts that He's placed within you and He knows what you have. He knows what you're capable of. He recognizes your potentiality. And He brings you hope. Because in the master's hand, you can take things like oil drums and x-ray skins, and you can create great instruments. It's on YouTube if you want to check it out sometime. Those of you who like music, just I think it's the Landfill Orchestra. Just Google that, and you'll, it'll come up. It's a video on it. It shows you the children. They're playing the music. They're well known. They're, they're very well known for this. But you see, when we see past the brokenness, that's what we do. But we have to trust ourselves into God's hands because God can do so much with our lives if we only allow Him. You know, there's a form of, a, and I'm going to try to speak some Japanese. Anybody here speak Japanese? Good. I can put you this and nobody will know. Um, there is a type of uh, restoration and it's called Kintsugi. That's spelled K-I-N-T. I think it's silent. S-U-G-I. And what this does is it takes the broken pieces of pottery and it reassembles the pot or the bowl or whatever the pottery is. And instead of trying to, and it seals it, and instead of trying to hide the 